Welcome to week one of uh, Intro to Youth Ministry. As I mentioned in the uh, intro video, we're going to start out this course by uh, focusing on the NSYR, the National Survey of Youth and Religion, and uh, responses to it and uh, kind of what it says about the changing landscape of American religion. Again, it's, it's a little bit old. Uh, the survey was conducted in the early 2000s, so it's been about 15 years now. And uh, all of the people who were interviewed in this survey would, uh, would now be at least in their 20s, some of them even in their early 30s. So uh, it's a little bit outdated, but the, the reality is that this, what this survey found uh, is that youth religion in the early 2000s was really, uh, it was different than what, what people expected. Every, the, the expectations going into this survey were that they would find that teenagers were rebelling against the religion of their parents. Um, that, you know, we were starting to see uh, drops in religious, in uh, church membership. Uh, we were seeing uh, denominations are in decline, and that has actually picked up since then. And so the expectation was, uh, you know, that, well, we're seeing uh, teens who are abandoning the faith of their parents. That is actually not what they found. Uh, the NSYR found that, by and large, American teenagers believe and practice what their parents believe and practice. Um, that, uh, so what that means, now that does not mean that they were all super pious, actually. What the NSYR found was that, on the whole, American teenagers are uh, very inarticulate about faith and, uh, and not very knowledgeable uh, about their own religious traditions. And in fact, what they concluded was that the dominant religion among American teenagers could not actually even be described as historic Christianity or any other religious tradition. It was actually something uh, they had to come up with a new term for it. And what they called it was moralistic therapeutic deism. Now, if you've taken classes with me before, uh, I tend to talk about this a lot. But uh, moralistic therapeutic deism is three things. Uh, moralistic means that they believe that the main goal of religion was to teach people to be good. And in fact, not even good, nice. Uh, Kinda Crazy Dean calls it the cult of nice. That the, the, the main purpose of religion is to create nice people. So it's moralistic, teaches basic niceness. Second part is therapeutic. And that is that uh, God wants me to be happy. God is a therapist. Uh, and so... Their, their, their view of God was that is sort of like a doting grandparent mixed with Santa Claus. So the, the goal is that, or not the goal, but, but uh, what God's chief aim, God's chief desire is for my happiness. So whatever makes me happy, as long as I'm being a good, nice person, is fine. I don't know if you can hear that siren going on. There's a, they're testing the the fire sirens in town. It'll go away. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me over it. But um, they, uh, so moralistic and therapeutic, and then the third part is probably the most distressing part, and that is deistic. Deism, if you know anything about religion in the 18th, 19th centuries, deism was a religious system that believed that there was a God uh, who created the universe, but that was not a personal God. It was not a God that was actively involved in the world. God created the world and then pretty much abandoned it to run on its own. And so deism was the uh, religion of the enlightenment, uh, of the age of science, where they, they determined that most natural processes happen uh, on their own. Um, 
you know, gravity and, and the, the laws of uh, thermodynamics and, and things like that. They could explain most natural phenomena by natural law. So what's the need for God then? Uh, they became suspicious of miracles. They became suspicious of God actually interacting with humanity at all. They couldn't explain where the universe came from, so they still believed in God, but he was not an actively involved God. And for the most part, uh, you could say that while, while they're not intellectual deists, they found that American teenagers were practical deists that uh, they didn't really have a place for God in their everyday lives um, outside of making them feel good. So they weren't pure deists or aren't pure deists, but they're practical deists because religion doesn't or didn't play a major role in their lives. So I, I describe it as God wants, the moralistic therapeutic deism is God wants me to be nice and happy and otherwise, he leaves me alone. Otherwise, God just kind of gets out of my way. So what they, what they found in the NSYR actually was not a rebellion against religion, but an apathy toward it. Um, they found that, that teenagers had no um, animosity toward religion, uh, but that it didn't play a major role in their lives. They believed in God but they were not particularly observant. And this kind of goes hand in hand with another phenomenon that we have seen in uh, American religion in the last 20 years or so that's called, uh, sometimes called the rise of the nuns. And that is that the proportion of Americans who when asked what their religious affiliation is will say none. They're not religious, they're not practicing. Now, most of these people are not atheists. It doesn't mean that they don't believe in God. It means they don't affiliate with organized religion. They believe in God, but they see little need for church or little need for organized religion. Because again, God is, the basics are, God wants me to be nice and good. God wants me to be happy. And otherwise, God pretty much leaves me alone. You know, he might help me out when I, you know, need something. But there is very little in the way of expectations. So they go hand in hand, I think. Um, and, and actually, the rise of the nuns is exactly what you would expect, um, given the fact that we have moralistic therapeutic deism. But the thing about moralistic therapeutic deism is that it's not new. It's just recently documented. But uh, they found that, again, most American teenagers were just copying and staying faithful to the religion of their parents. So moralistic therapeutic deism, in my opinion, has been the dominant American religion for at least two generations, maybe even three. Uh, I think go, you can go back probably to the 1960s. And I think you start to see this develop, which is interestingly, 60s, the 60s were the peak of uh, mainline Protestantism in America. In the late 60s and then into the 70s, um, all of the mainline Protestant denominations began to decline. And so, but, but actually that was from a, a, a major explosion. After World War II, uh, religious affiliation just skyrocketed in America. This is when it became, you know, where it was socially expected that you were a member of a church. Uh, and it hadn't always been that way, but it was in the mid 20th century, and now we're we're kind of coming down from that. And so uh, I don't even think moralistic therapeutic deism is a new thing in the 20th century. I actually think that we've had this before. Um, I think if you read, go back and read the accounts of uh, Puritan New England on the eve of the Great Awakening, you would find that. Uh, People like Jonathan Edwards were were describing um, uh, the uh, the religion in the churches or out of the churches in in Puritan New England as roughly very much like moralistic therapeutic deism. That it was people who he said were greatly insensitive to the things of God. They were just sort of they didn't they hadn't rejected it, but 
they weren't particularly pious. They just were apathetic and lazy about about uh, faith. And I think that's kind of where we are now. So um, I will leave you to read these. Uh, so the, the the readings for this week are uh, first uh, is actually from this book, which is not one of our required books, but this is the actual um, results of the NSYR. So this was written in 2006 by the actual uh, scholars who did the survey or who led up the survey. And so uh, I've just given you a chapter from this where they are um, giving you the data. So there's a lot of charts. It, it looks longer than it is, but there's a lot of charts in here. Uh, and then the, and then the first two chapters of Kenda Creasy Dean's book, where she is going to be an, uh, interpreting and responding to that NSYR data. So, uh, and then make sure you do take a look at the discussion question, which is going to be responding to the NSYR findings, whether you agree with their assessment, because actually uh, one of the things that Dean notes is that when she interviewed teenagers and shared with them the findings of this survey, some of them were actually offended by it and did not think that that was an accurate representation of American teenagers. So I want to know, well, what do you think? Uh, you're not teenagers, but you, some of you uh, were very recently, and, and, and you interact with them. Again, if you're working in youth ministry, I want to know what you think. Um, do, you, do you think this is a fair description? And if so, why do you think it developed? And if not, uh, then why do you think they had such trouble getting teenagers to articulate their faith in the survey? So I will leave you to week one.